Hi, and welcome to Pioneering Again. And this is a special edition of Pioneering Again, where we get a chance to speak to people who have obviously converted to the one true God truth through their own endeavors and through the Holy Spirit working through them. And today, I'd just like to introduce to you a very special friend of mine um, who's recently come to the one true God truth and is also a pastor or was a pastor, shall I say, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And his name is Johann Stein. Um, he's originally from um, South Africa, but now resides in Georgia. And he's on a mission trip in Georgia. He left everything in South Africa to go and uh, work in Georgia. And he's a very brave soul in doing that. And there's not many people who um, understand for the truth for these times in Georgia. But the Lord really impressed on Johan to leave everything and to go and preach the gospel to the lost souls in Georgia. So he's doing a very remarkable job at the moment. But anyway, I'm just going to um, introduce you to Pastor Johann Stein. Hello, Pastor. How are you? Hello. It's going well this side. Thank you very much for the opportunity. That's no problem. Welcome to Pioneering Again uh, YouTube channel. Um, gives you an opportunity to explain how you came to the one true God truth and, you know, all the other uh, difficulties that you may have had in being a believer and follower of this truth, which is biblical, of course. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you some questions, if you don't mind, sir, and obviously just answer them to the best of your ability. Um, we thank God for technology. Uh, you, you're so far from Jamaica, thousands of miles um, apart, but yet by God's grace, we can see each other, talk to each other and encourage each other. So I praise God for the wonders of technology. So, Johan, the first question I'd like to ask you is, how did you become a Christian? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, in South Africa, of course, South Africa used to be a, a strong Christian nation, a Protestant nation, but mainly Calvinist. So I grew up in a Calvinist home um, in the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, but the first time I had a personal meeting with the Lord was when I was about five years old. Okay. Um, I just, it was a little tract that my grandmother read and I felt so impressed by Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts and I felt him knocking at my heart and you know, it's a simple faith. Uh, and, and that just impressed me that this God is real. I accepted him as my savior, even at that young age. But of course, there's so many things that I didn't understand. So I had more than one conversion later, especially when I was 14. But when I was about 12 years old, I, I, I got a calling from the Lord to go into ministry. Um, at that stage, I was still in the, in the Dutch Reformed Church. It was interesting that in, at that stage, um, it was my first um, contact with uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Had some contact at that stage with a series that was presented in our town, but of course we didn't accept the message. But nonetheless, it did make an impact. And uh, in, in that same year, I got a calling on my life to become a, 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 a minister, or well, not a minister, but somebody that brings the word of God to the world. Um, uh, very strong. Uh, I can talk long on that. I'm not going to elaborate it on it. Um, but then, of course, the teenage years, very stormy years. Um, and then uh, I eventually, at, when I went to uh, national conscription, we had to do um, um, army. We were forced to do army for two years at that stage. Yeah, that there's something else maybe I must mention as well is that I grew up at the same time on one side my um, you know I grew up with faith in the house but the other side I grew up with um, evolution mm. so I always had that fight 
inside of me, you know, what to believe. And what, when I eventually was in the army, I became an atheist. That's, that's a whole uh, era of my life that could, could take an whole interview on its own. Um, but, you know, that's what I don't understand people being so excited about being atheists. I, I see them so many times on, on these trolling Christian websites, um, giving their arguments and, you know, trying to refute Christianity. Remember that when I was a, when I was a, um, Christ, when I was an atheist, I was definitely not proud of it. A terrible time of my life. I mean, it, I, I, I've met the Lord before, you must understand. I, I knew what it was to know him in experiencing this this whole thing of not believing that there's no, that when you die, it's everything is just gone, you know, it's finished. It was despair for me. But uh, if it, after about a year and a half, two years, uh, it wasn't such a long period of my life, uh, I met the Lord again. And it was not any proof no lightning from heaven, no, no proof that evolution is wrong even. Um, it was, I was not even confronted on my belief or, of origins or anything like that. But what, what pulled me back to the Lord is my sin. Um, oh. You know, the fact that people can run away from anything, but they cannot really run away from guilt, from, from the conscience, from the fact that the, the Holy Spirit constantly pulls at us, push us, and, and just wants to get us back. That is so uh, true, um, Johan. That is so true. And it was, it was, uh, I was, I was starting to look for the Lord. I said, I prayed to the God, the creator of the universe. That's who I create. Because I was confused about so many religions. Um, I was involved in, before that, in spiritualism as well. That's also another um, part of my history. I had, you know, I started asking these questions, which faith is true? This purpose of my life, I want to know what is the truth. And then I started praying to this God, I don't know, but I, know, I knew that the creator God must be the important one. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can try and search for other gods, but if you need to speak to the creator. So I, I spoke to the creator and asked him to reveal himself to me. And that's when I, I got to the Bible, and I believe there's a reason why Psalm 51 is right in the middle of the Bible, and that's how it touched me. And it's just amazing. It just really touched me, as it touched David at that stage of the sinning with Bathsheba. And it just brought me back to the Lord, and I made a decision to go and study theology. And so before going further, which um, church organization did you study theology with? Okay, that was the Dutch Reformed Church. Okay. It's similar to Presbyterian theology. Okay. And so from there, when you studied theology in the Dutch Reformed Church, how is it that God was working on your mind and on your heart to try to search him out some more? Yeah, I was confronted there, I think, with even more evil than with good. Wow. <laughs> You could read from Ellen White that, you know, she warns us about the universities. Um, and I, I still believed in evolution. You know, I was trying to get these two to work together. How, <laughs> you, how did God use evolution, etc.? cetera? Um, but I sort of pushed that back a bit in, in my mind because I had an experience with the creator of the universe. Okay. So that dominated um, my thinking. So even though there were a lot of other things happening, that was still the dominant thing. But the problem is that even though this was supposed to be a, a fairly conservative university, it was still far more liberal than what the Bible teaches. There was a lot of good that I got from there, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the studies. Mm. I learned so much. I learned a lot of philosophy. I did psychology three-year psychology. So there was a lot of things that I learned, but also a lot of things I had to unlearn. But there I sort of got converted to the Calvinist theology. You know, okay. the, 
election and that God decided he's going to heaven, he's going to hell. And, and it just made, made God a monster. But, but by my fifth year, I also got involved with, with charismatic friends. Um, and I've had many, many instances where I've had contact with charismatics, etc. Everything is bad. I mean, I, I've had experiences where I've really learned a lot from God, uh, even through these things, because all over the Holy Spirit just speaks to your, to your conscience, you know. And Absolutely. The problem is it's so confusing because you're hearing so many different voices. Mm. But on my fifth year, I got baptized. Was I did not sign the document the church wanted me to sign. There's a document that, that you must admit or sign or confess, not admit, confess that the three main documents of the church are not only in accordance with the Bible, but on the same level as the Bible. Oh, and really? I, wow. You have to do that. You have to say it's got the same authority. Then I went into business with my one friend that studied with me. Um, we, we began a computer business. We had a very successful computer business down in Stellenbosch near the Cape. Um, but during that time, we, um, my partner and I, we watched some videos of Walter Weith, uh, mm -hmm. which made a big impact. For that time, it gave us good warning against stuff like Freemasons because we were definitely contacted by Freemasons to become part of Freemasonry and when we declined that we, our business had got a huge hit. Wow. But so we've got a lot of tales to tell about that as well. But my main thing is um, with Walter um, I had a look again at the beliefs of the Adventist Church um and i think him as well as a few other videos from other people in the world made an imp impression on me to reject evolution which was a huge step for me yeah and, and you know yeah, Walter Vibe has been very um prolific in helping people to you know turn away from atheism to actually you know serving for god so to speak um but you know you're going to speak more on Walter Vibe uh, later on. So continue on, Johan. I, I realized this truth quite before the videos of Walter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, it just helped me. Uh, and, and you know, God is a gentle God. He, he knows what we are ready for. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that as well when we work with other people. When we dump a lot of information on them, they, they're not always ready to take it. Um, yeah. Stage, it was important to get rid of this false theology and this false perceptions in my life. Um, if you dump all this other stuff on me, I would probably have just rejected it. So God knows what we are ready for. And we just need to be there to testify, to just be a witness um, and let God do the work. Uh, don't press people into corners, uh, you know, don't push them into corners. Um, so yes, so for me, that was important. I made, you know, I, I had all these little steps I had to climb and get, get to the point where I could accept it. But eventually, you know, we, we just rejected the message of Walter, what he brought, um, and decided, you know, that the Ten Commandments no longer applies and, you mm. know, all that all dispensationalist rubbish. Um, but um, God didn't let me go, and I just kept on searching. Eventually, my wife and I realized that the Sabbath truth is the truth. Okay. Um, we actually made a, a decision the one day that we'll, we'll keep the Sabbath for one month. And because we're not sure if we're supposed to, to keep it. We were having all these conflict, you know, the one day is as, as important as another. We shouldn't, you know, all these verses. And yeah. Just realize, you know, God is not going to strike us with a lightning bolt because we, we do this. And we decided to do it. Just take the step of faith. My partner reacted so viciously against us. Um, yeah, I could imagine. 
he was my best friend. I mean, we 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 got we had children together, like really at the same time almost. And um, he was the one that baptized me. Uh, it was really a, a very emotional thing to go through. Mm. We had Bible study every week together, and all all of a sudden that just stopped. He just completely shut us out because just because we did we did this terrible experiment. But just that step of faith, God just immediately showed us what is the truth and and opened up doors of understanding that was just immense. So okay. Just so really, us. that that must have been a very um, tough time for you emotionally because obviously your friend who you set up the business with um, yeah. was more than a friend. It was more like a brother, it seems like. And yeah. so God, in a way, he had to reveal to you that he had to remove something or someone out of your life who could possibly be a hindrance to your progression with him because that's what god does from time to time we, we have to be fully aware of that uh, that's true I've, I've tried to reach out to him but he's not interested at all and it's a sad story for me because we were mm. really close friends um but it's just one of those things um uh for him it wasn't very important to uh you know, get his PhDs. He's currently a, a uh, uh, I'm not sure if he's a professor yet or whatever, but he became a um, lecturer at a university in South Africa, um, even though it's not wrong to study, but the prestige can be a problem. Yeah, it depends what you are studying, because obviously, as we know, um, studying error or, or studying things <clears throat> which contradicts the word of God, is going to have some type of impact on, on your ability of knowing who God really is. Um, and, that's, and that is one of the laws of the universe. That's why Jesus said in one of his um, discourses, be careful what you hear. So, you know, we have to be careful what we're taking in. Uh, obviously, Ellen White talks about um, God in the avenue of your mind as well. And I think sometimes as Christians, we, quite, we are quite presumptuous we are quite presumptuous with some of the things we watch, listen to, or even speaking to other people. One of the greatest things Jesus said in the last days is that deception is going to be strong. So we have to be fully aware of these things and not be so blinded or presumptuous in entering into certain establishments or watching things on TV or listening to others that could um, influence you to go down the wrong path. So, yeah. As you say, we're presumptuous that oh, we'll be able to manage, you know, we'll be able to handle it. Yeah. And we, can, we can just fall. We must be very careful. Um, that's why Ellen White said, you go and study those kind of things and you think you're okay to handle it. No, you're not. No, yeah. Yeah. I think it was Martin Luther that warned as well, sending our children to the universities or stuff because i think he was saying i believe it's in a great controversy he said that any institution that is not under the word of god will surely become corrupt and mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know we bind ourselves up with organizations even our career prospects you know we bind ourselves up where potentially the devil could really influence us away from god and i see that happening with a lot of people a lot of people we really do need to be wise on these things so johan obviously you were into the charismatic faith for a while good part of your christian walk so how did you actually transition then from being well you, you were a dutch reformer then you become a charismatic and so how did you come from a charismatic movement into being a seventh day adventist well I started looking, watching uh, videos again. I started watching PABN and even Oak Channel um, and just asked the Lord to show me the truth. And especially after we've, we've done this, this experiment of keeping the Sabbath, mm. we realized that this is the truth. And in a, in a very short time, we decided to uh, stop uh, going to the charismatic movement. But maybe... I should just rewind a few months before that. We did really serious Bible study as a group together. 
And God showed us, you know, that the the, the world's denominations is part of Babylon. Wow. Uh, so we we at that stage had a Bible study group on our own. We you know we completely left the the organized churches of the world, uh, and we just started doing that. And I think that was maybe also a step in the right direction. Okay. To, to just get away from from the organized denominations uh, as such. Um, and, and that made an impact. And then, of course, yeah, we, we started attending a, a, an Adventist church. And in a very short time, uh, it still links with that same pastor that, um, I met in uh, when I was 12 years old. Um, and very soon I had a link to, with leadership, etc. And, uh, they wanted me to maybe consider becoming a pastor. Okay. And I had a meeting with them. I, I flew up. We, uh, that was down in the Cape in South Africa. So I flew up to Johannesburg to go and meet the leadership. But I mean, this was still very, very new. Um, and I just said, you know, this, I, I'm still in a business. I'm in a, you don't just walk out of a, a partnership, you know, you, you have responsibilities. So, um, uh, I said, there's so many things I still need to organize. Uh, I can tell you long stories. The, the bottom line is, um, I went back home and the answer the Lord gave me is not now. And they also said, not now. Mm. For one very good reason, I was officially not an Adventist yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they were even considering taking you on as a pastor, even though you were not officially an Adventist. I was not. I was not. So wow, that's I, incredible to I hear. Baptized because I felt very strong about my baptism that I had. So I just had mm. a confession of faith. But I, I became an Adventist. That was February two thousand and eight. I became an Adventist March two thousand and eight. <laughs> so, but then of course I had to run my business, continue. Um, and as the thin econ economy in South Africa was going down, and it's still going down. Mm. We um, we focused on um, on just getting the business running and going well, but my partner and I, you know, our, our relationship was not doing very well. Mm. And I, what happened is, we had a a computer shop, which of course our best day of business was on on Saturday. And all of a sudden, I refused to work on Saturdays, but our one shop, I opened it on Sundays. So I started doing business on Sundays. We, we had two shops. And that's what I did basically for the rest of the time I was in, in partnership. Uh, and then many months went by. By August, um, my, and I realized, I, I really just, Told the Lord, I, this, uh, I've got a heart to do his work for you. I remember I was in an email with, uh, with a family member of mine explaining to him about the mark of the beast. Mm. And a customer came into the shop. Um, a guy that was very unreasonable, but you know, we've learned to be very friendly with their unreasonable customers. So we took him, took him to my technician. And explain, you know, explain what's going on and trying to fix his problem. But while, while he was talking there and I was just sitting there and I was just telling the Lord, Lord, I don't want to do this. I want to go back and do that, what I was doing there on that email. I want to go and do that. That's where my heart is. And when the, when that man left, 10 minutes later, I received a phone call for the first time again from the leadership saying that they should have phoned me earlier, but things happened and everything, but they want me to come up again for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just confirmation. But that's not all. I, I really need to share this because this is really a miraculous story. I flew up to go for an interview again in Johannesburg. The president of the, at that stage, the Transvaal Conference, phoned me and said they've decided they're going to appoint me as a pastor. Wow. And official date of, of becoming a pastor is the 1st of November. 
So when you actually became a Seventh Day Adventist pastor, um, what was it like having your own church and you know dealing with people, etc.? Um, oh, how many hours do you have? <laughs> um, no, it was it was great for me. It was it was great. On the other side, there were some negative things as well because as time passes, I realized, you know, I thought had this idea oh i'm walking into heaven you know this is the church of god this is just a place to be and i personally believe that is where god wanted me i don't have a doubt about it it's not like oh god i made the decision to go to the wrong church that's where god wanted me to be mm. i'm convinced about that um, but then i realized they were they were they were definitely error and i had a huge battle with false teachings um in, in the church I was such you know, as well I was set free from Calvinism to begin with and then I come into the Adventist church and realize just they they teaching Calvinism um, I had to do with teachings like with Morris Venden and all these kind of Morris Venden that's that's just a modified version of Calvinism um, and uh, you know this teaching false teachings of original sin etc uh, and and I had to start grappling with that. It took me quite a while to understand all that, the whole thing of the nature of Christ, all these things. It was a huge schooling era for me. Um, and um, I made many friends and many enemies at the same time. But I knew I had to fight for the truth. That was what I was doing. And I really, I love doing it. Um, so, yes. So basically, I had a, a lot of experience with, you know, challenging error. Mm. And um, may, many times I was frowned upon because, you know, I was this little newcomer in the church. And I'm confronting people that grew up as Adventists. So that was not always, you know, I was seen, you are arrogant to challenge the leaders of the church, you know, that kind of thing. So that did happen. But there were many true guys in the church you know that that also understood the truth so it's, it's not just like i'm a sole fighter for the truth um but it was it was a challenge but i enjoyed it um and uh, it it was it was something good it was really something good concerning concerning the truth concerning the father and the son Yeah, let's something. get to that part now. How did you, could you talk initially that there is errors? So what was it that sparked your interest into studying more about God? What was the errors um, which you saw in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, what happened is um, uh, I, I always had this whole issue about not understanding the, the Trinity as such, mm. which, which is not difficult. Um, to be in that condition, even after studying six years at university, I still couldn't understand it. I just knew one thing that I just never accepted this whole thing of God being a boiled egg or a candle or, you know, the ice cream, those kind of things are that is ice vapor and water. <laughs> yeah. mm. I, I just never bought into that rubbish. Um, but I also just knew one thing is very important that Jesus Christ must be God. So the, I had I had run-ins earlier in my life with with um, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I just realized that's not the way to go. Mm. Um, and uh, but you know there were always these good arguments, and I just couldn't get past them because looking at how the Bible talks about God and the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the fact for the fact that the Holy Spirit you know there's nowhere a place where we're supposed to pray to the Holy Spirit so I eventually came to the point where I just taught my con congregation as well that stay with the language of the Bible um, I did not make up my mind I put this into the back of my head yeah uh, and it's just basically said uh, the, that the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit as being a person in the sense that you can sin against him, 
but the Bible does not teach us to um, to pray to him. So don't do it. Um, and then, you know, talking about the son and the father, I, I, I didn't know everything. And I just sort of left it on the back burner mm. because there were so many other areas I had to deal with. Um, and not only that, my own life was not sorted out either yet. So I had to struggle with that as well. You know, a lot of people think that the pastors, their lives are just air okay and they just have the responsibility of, of sorting out the, the congregation. But I had to sort out my own life. And then I still have my, I had my family to try and sort out. And, you know, there's just so many things. And then, of course, I think you, you don't want to rock the boat. If you want to start uh, searching for things that can cause problems, then you rather, you know, don't do it. Um, especially when you're earning a salary. I don't say that you 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 uh, believe in something because of the salary, but there are so many uh, unconscious things that happen. You, you don't decide these things, but just the mere fact that you are dependent financially does have some influence in the way that you think, even though you don't really want to do it. It's just the way that the human psyche works. When Jesus came to earth, how many Pharisees and scribes and lawyers were part of the disciples? Zero. None. None. What did it take? It, it took um, tax collectors. Mm. Fishermen. Those were, those were the people that were his um, uh, um, disciples. And guess what? That same thing um, happened again with the pioneers. Mm. Miller was not some professor at some Oxford University or wherever. Uh, he was a farmer. Yeah. These are the people. Look, look who was our messenger? 17-year-old girl without formal schooling. Um, that's what God does. Not because it's wrong to study, but it's because people depend so much on their schooling and their position that even though they don't want to fight against it, it becomes an unco unconscious thing that happens, that you just do it. From the early ch church, I mean, real early church, the apostles, there were only one Pharisee that really stood out, and it was Paul. And how did he get converted? After basically being hit over the head and made blind, <laughs> and he had to shut him away. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a real miracle, and there were probably many people praying for Paul. They were praying for him. That was a powerful event that happened. And I think we must do the same. We must start praying for the leaders as the people prayed for Paul. Amen. So what was the thing that sparked your interest to really search out the matter about the one true God truth? Well, I resigned ministry, not because of teaching, but because I wanted to become a missionary. Mm. Um, I searched for help financial help um, from the conference, from the union, from the division as well. Um, and I just met closed doors everywhere. I searched for help from personal people. I just wanted some support. We wanted to go do ministry. Um, I wanted to become a missionary in Georgia. I had a real um, burden on my heart for, for this country. So we decided we're going to do it on our own. There's a long story around that. I'm not going to bore you with the details now. But eventually we just <clears throat> got on the plane and moved to Georgia on my own. And um, what was necessary for me, of course, is to be independent at that stage. Um, and it was only a few months ago. It's not long ago. It was around about April that I, I was still struggling with this whole issue of the Trinity. It was just nibbling in the back of my mind. And I was watching a few videos. Um, but during this time, I was on Facebook forums uh, fighting against anti-Trinitarians or non-Trinitarians rather. Mm. I, was, I was chatting with them and giving all the usual explanations, you know, of 
um, life unborrowed, and all these quotes, I used all of them always telling the people that, you know, this is not the truth. And uh, the main thing is I kept on asking the Lord one very important question. If I'm wrong, show me. And, and this is a warning. This is a stern warning to anybody. If you are going to ask the Lord to show you, if you're going to challenge him, be warned, he is going to do it. Amen. Um, um, so, so what was your challenge then? How did the Lord challenge you when you asked him? Well, that's, that's the main thing. I asked him that. And I think one of the things, it was not the main thing, but one of the things that happened was at that stage, uh, David Gates made an announcement against the Trinity. He had a whole sermon against the Trinity. And that just, you know, it struck me because until then, there was absolutely zero church leaders that ever supported the non-Trinitarian movement. And I had a great respect for David Gates. And I thought, wow, this guy, maybe I should just, you know, think about this. And, and, and it made me think. Mm. Of course, he retracted his opinion after Walter Weith had a chat with him. Uh, so basically, he was rebuked, <laughs> and he he went back on his on his decision. But that's unimportant. The main thing is, I got challenged with that, and um, I started asking the Lord, "He must show me." And to me, the main thing that came through for me, the main thing, and it's still for me the primary thing, is what does it mean? That Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Get to the the whole issue about the the Trinity and only begotten Son. Just it just didn't it didn't make sense at all. Um, and I've been through all these arguments of monogenes meaning the Greek word for only begotten. Monogenes meaning unique Son of God. And I've been through those studies, and I know it's rubbish because modern Greek use that word monogenes. If you translate it and you ask a modern Greek, they know it means only begotten. That's what it means. Okay. Give it another meaning is just a complete rubbish. Um, and, and even Koine Greek, the Bible Greek, the difference between Koine Greek and modern Greek is actually fairly small. Um, if, if you grew up as a modern Greek person, you'll be able to understand biblical Greek even if you've never read it in your life. Um, it's, it's not that far different. Uh, so if you ask a Greek person today, what does that mean? <laughs> it's clear, that's what it means. Only begotten son of God. See, the, the, the thing that kept nagging me is, for me, there were two distinct, distinct characteristics of the Antichrist that John gave specifically. And there's only two. Mm. There are only two. And the first one, of course, is the Father and the Son. But I sort of just always moved over that and I just said, okay, the Roman Catholics have got a wrong idea of it <laughs> and we've got the right idea of it. But I knew that was not the right answer. <laughs> but I was focusing so much on the second one and that was um, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, mm. which of course is a huge problem in the Adventist Church because of the, the theology of mainly people like Desmond Ford Morris Venden and all the likes. Um, and not only them, I mean, I had a huge fight with um, uh, uh, Clifford Goldstein at a, a workers' meeting of the pastors where he came to visit us. Now, Cliff, for those who don't know, Clifford Goldstein is the editor of the Sabbath School Quarterlies, the Sabbath School yeah. books, lesson books of the church. He's been that for many, many, many years. Um, and probably I would say he is the most influential person in the SDA church by far because he's got that pen. And now I say, oh, yeah, it's, it's a committee that sets it up, but they don't understand the power of an editor. Um, and he, and he's, he's an extremely good orator. He's good with convincing people. He would make the changes. And if I if I read the Sabbath school quarterlies, I can read him inside it because I've had, you know, discussions with him. You can see his arguments. And he himself said Desmond Ford was 
was correct in his theology. Wow. It was only about 1844, but his theology was correct. Oh. And, and the main thing was, he had the wrong understanding of the nature of Christ. And if you've got the wrong understanding of the nature of Christ, you've got the spirit of the Antichrist. And if you've got the spirit of the Antichrist in your Sabbath school quarterly, you've got a serious problem. So, Johan, when you decided to uh, actually um, study more about Jesus and uh, the Father sending his only begotten son, um, obviously you had a family and you had your wife. So were you sharing some of these truths with them as well? And no. if you were, what were they thinking? They, they accepted it right away. Amen. Thanks. You know... I was always honest with my children concerning these things. And they would ask me, especially coming back from Sabbath school or wherever, how is it that Jesus prays to himself? You know, he's God and he's praying to God. How does it work? They, children are not stupid. Mm. So they would ask me these questions. Um, how is it that his father is God, but he's also God? Uh, all these different questions. And I never gave them a stupid answer of, uh, an egg or a candle or anything like that. Um, I many times just told them, I don't know myself yet. I'm studying it. Um, and uh, gave them a little bit of an answer of what I believed and so on, but never gave them a, a, a very uh, a, a dubious answer. So when I eventually um, shared when I've really come to conclusion about the simple truth mm. that Jesus is really the son of God, they just accepted it because they knew what I taught them before about this. Amen. Um, and it made sense. That's the main thing. It's, it must make sense. Of course, we don't, there's a lot of things that mis that's mystery, but this is not a mystery. Jesus Christ Amen. is the and that is so, so important. If you do not understand that, you miss the gospel. Amen. I've just been in a, in a conversation with somebody that they just slammed me and said, you know, why, why don't you preach the gospel? And, and why do you focus on all these things? You know, this is a mysterious thing. We don't understand God, this and this and this. We must rather just preach the gospel and the three angels message. John 3 verse 16 is the gospel. Amen. That's the gospel. How can you say it's not the gospel? If you misunderstand who Jesus is, you <coughs> misunderstand the gospel. You miss what it's about. Amen. Obviously, you and your family accepted um, the truth about God and his son. So how did that initially have an impact, obviously, with you being a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and trying to get support for your missionary trip in Georgia, um, which you're currently undertaking right now. So how has this truth impacted your life, Johan? Well, let's begin with the positive side. The positive thing is it brought such a lot of peace in my heart concerning who God is. Mm. But all of a sudden, I had victory in my life I've never had. <laughs> um, it changed my heart. It changed my life. Uh, just understanding that God sent his son, not his partner or colleague. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one person, one, this was a president of a conference that told me, that posted uh, in response to John 3 verse 16, that John 3 verse 16 says that God sent himself and that's the ultimate price. No, it's not. Abraham would have rather put himself on that altar mm. than his son. They don't understand the father heart of God. A father right. would rather put himself, that's not the, the highest price. Your child is a much, much higher price than giving yourself. Mm. And they say that, oh, by giving himself, like David Ashrick says, it's child sacrifice, mm. which is blasphemy. It is blasphemy to say that it's child sacrifice. 
um, um, and and the one one the same president of a conference said, "Yeah, we were teaching that um, God is creating little demigods," and and then he was referring to Jesus as being a demigod, and I, I just told him. You be better be careful because you are blaspheming against Jesus Christ by doing that. And of course, he was Absolutely. saying, you know, that this is blasphemy because it is. It is blasphemy to call Jesus a, a demigod. Um, and and yeah, so this is this is so liberating. And I'm telling you, yeah, that's on the positive side. You ask me the question, what else impact? Um, now, I'm still officially a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I've, I've decided not to resign because if I, if I can have an influence in the church, it will be great. Mm. But eventually, if, if nothing will happen, I will probably just resign. Um, but I want to do the same as Martin Luther did. Martin Luther didn't, didn't resign. He said he'll fight to change the church. So, yeah, that is most probably that will happen. But concerning my mission, we did not have a lot of financial support for our mission, but we did have. Um, and, you know, when, when you try and run your mission work just by yourself, it is a huge challenge. Basically, all my support dried up. Uh, I... I still had one person supporting me, but it was also a little bit of a business agreement. Uh, but that was it. Um, nobody else supported me anymore. So that was a huge thing. But I mean, fortunately... You've got family to support. You've got um, gr grown up children now. You've got your wife that needs supporting financially. And yet, <laughs> it seems like you know, you've entered into this journey now and now you accept the one true God. It's like you're really suffering more than you've ever done. Uh, interestingly enough, people warned me about this as well and said that uh, Satan will not let me go. Mm. Um, and I think also God allows it because he needs to check your, check your seriousness. How serious are you about this? Your commitment. Yeah. Commitment needs to be checked. And we've had terrible things happen to us, cars breaking. I had to overhaul my car. The list is so long, it's impossible to believe that everything was just a coincidence. Um, so we had a huge amount. So on the one side, we had this huge amount of um, uh, things that are happening that requires money. And on the other side, the little bit of support we had just completely drying up. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what happened. Um, but you know, if, when that happened, I, I realized that this was it, but it was not easy. I'll tell you that. No, I could imagine. So well, Johan, you obviously, um, you're from South Africa. So is Walter Weif and Martin Smith, I believe his name is. So have you had much correspondence with those particular two persons? Walter Weif in particular and um, Martin Smith, because I understand that you used to know them very well. Yes, yes, I did. I did know Walter personally and Martin. Martin, um, special, something that we share in common is he wanted to become a missionary in Georgia as well. Um, so that was on his heart. And when he couldn't get financial support, and not only that, there was a couple of other issues as well. Um, he then went with Walter. So that's how we ended up with Walter. Mm. Now, we still had a lot of communication. And from time to time, I had personal communication with him on WhatsApp. And um, I was really frustrated when I saw the video that Walter made, where he lashed strongly a guy out against people who believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God, mm. which was such a shocker to me because I knew how strongly he, he felt about the older translations like King James. And now all of a sudden he was fighting for the, the liberal translations, mm. for the Jesuit translations that, that translated to the unique son of God. He was rejecting 
Jesus as being the only begotten son of God. And that was a great shocker. And then I contacted Martin. Um, I, I tried to, you know, walk on eggs and really just started asking him questions, you know, if they, if they accept Jesus as being the only begotten son of God and what do they believe about it? Uh, I was trying to be as, um, you know, I didn't want, yeah, I wanted to be tactful. I don't, yeah. didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to make him angry. Um, I didn't want to push him away. But his immediate reaction was in full defense, uh, but not defense, attacking me for even asking such a question. Wow. Um, and I was really blown away by that uh, because that's not the kind of relationship I had with him. Um, then I just asked him a couple of questions and, and the things just went around in circles and circles and he kept on throwing out the same old um, arguments and saying, yeah, but it, Jesus is not really the only begotten son of God, etc. And, um, you know, it's amazing that so, so many prominent people, Johan, believe this false teaching and you know they influence thousands of people all around the world and yet they're propagating error and darkness it, it just my mind boggles with disbelief on how satan is so subtly strong to, to use so many prominent people to propagate his falsehoods and the sad thing is um and I'm sure you agree with this, um, Johan, that most of these people, uh, when you do try to share the truth to them, and a lot of them, I believe that they do see it, but because of pride, because of the influence they're going to lose, they, they are going to lose as a result of accepting the one true God, many of them crucify the Savior afresh rather than crucifying themselves um, for the truth. And I believe Walter Weiffer is one of them. I believe Stephen Ball is another one, Doug Batchelor. These people, they've had so much evidence to say that the Trinity is not true, and yet they still uphold the falsehoods of the church. What would you want to say about that? No, that is absolutely true. And you know where you can see it. And this is something I ask Martin as well. I've got the the evidence um, I've asked him to pray with me that God must show us you know if we are wrong because I can be wrong and he can be wrong we mm -hmm. have to have a teachable spirit no matter how sure we are of what we believe and he was not willing to do it um, and, and I've had this with so many so many um, uh, uh, church leaders that they were just not willing to even consider that there's a chance that they might be wrong. Um, even today, when I'm speaking to, to Trinitarians, um, I, I ask, you know, and they, they, they come to me with, with arguments, and then I ask God, Lord, if I'm wrong in this, show me. I need to understand because, you know, I need to learn what's the truth. We, even though I might know the truth, I might, I might have something in the truth that's wrong. Mm. Um, you know, you need to learn. And sometimes you'll find that somebody else, even though they are wrong, they see something wrong in what you believe in, which is wrong. So yeah. you need to be open to be teachable. Um, <clears throat> the, one guy, the one guy I spoke to, he just, I asked him, you know, are you willing to pray? And he said, no, I'm not willing to pray this because I know I'm right. Wow. Such yeah. arrogance. Such arrogance. Well, and, well and, uh, Johan, as you know, we as God's people, professed people, and one true God believers all around the world, we do have an incredibly massive, arduous task of trying to reach the folks with this message. What type of methods have you been using to try and um, win people to this truth? I've been uh, spending a lot of time in WhatsApp chats, mm -hmm. personally contacting people. MS, uh, uh, Facebook Messenger. Um, uh, I've reached out a lot 
on Facebook. I've been posting a lot of stuff on Facebook. Um, I'm planning to also release a few videos, but I've just never been able to do that because on this place we have to do, there's a lot of things and responsibilities at the moment. Um, but Facebook is where I spend a lot of time. And mm. I have a, quite a few people that I've been able to reach there um, that, that I've been able to share with. Even, even when I've had conversations on other people's pages of, you know, where they, they started pushing for the Trinity message and I've responded to that. I've had some of their followers and just starting to argue with them and saying, you know, but what you are saying is not making sense. <laughs> <laughs> saying, but this is, well, why, how can you deny that Jesus is the only begotten son of God? And yeah. people are realizing this and I'm telling you, this movement is not small. Mm. There are many people standing up to the truth. Um, Absolutely, all over the world. No, yeah, this is this is not just another splinter group in the church. This is not mm. just something else. Oh, yeah, and other people having new light and you know, all that rubbish that people are saying. Before we end this interview, um, I'd just like you to talk more about your missionary endeavors you're doing in Georgia. And, you know, if there's anybody, any of our viewers out there that would like to support Johan and his family in helping to spread the one true God truth um, in conjunction with the Three Angels message, because it is part of the Three Angels message. Um, um, Johan, if you'd like to give us your details, I'll put them up on the screen at the end so people can contact you if they wish to support you. Because I know you're doing a really grand job in Georgia. It's a tough place. Um, it's in Eastern Europe. The people's minds are darkened beyond belief. And there's, there's hardly no one else doing what you're doing. And when you told me your story on how you left everything, you left a good job, you had a nice house all in South Africa to um, go to Georgia, you know, I, I think it would be a crime not to support somebody like you and your family. So just if you'd like to just tell our viewers exactly um, what you're trying to do in Georgia. And then at the end, I will put up a, a, you know, a sign where they can contact you if they wish to support you. So proceed, my brother. I mean, now, um, I can quickly just tell people a little bit about Georgia and Mm. 30 minutes, seconds. Um, Georgia is a small country wedged in between Armenia, Turkey, and Russia. So we're right there, uh, close to all the action in the world, mm. um, uh, squished between mountains. Very small country. There's about 3.7 million people in this country, um, of which only 300 are Seventh day Adventists. Wow. So uh, it's it's a very bare country concerning tr truth. Um, the main church here is the Orthodox Church. Um, and I need to be careful what I say because they rule the country. Mm. Um, so um, I can say that they at least have Christian values. So I, I appreciate that. Um, but I'm not going to divulge a lot here about that now. Mm. Uh, social media can be a dangerous place and i don't want want to say anything but the main thing is the people are good people at least have christian values but um they don't like it when you differ with with their belief system mm. uh, the adventist church in this country has been destroyed three times in history what I mean by destroyed is the people were killed till there were none left. <laughs> wow. Uh, now that's of course not at all the art that you have today. The people in Georgia, well, never, that's not the art of the people today. I'm just saying the history of this church. And uh, um, yeah, so you don't, you don't want to really differ. And if you go openly against uh, the church here, you'll, be deported out of the country and that i appreciate it that they you know they want to protect the culture they want to protect the religion and so on so i appreciate that um they don't have 
for instance, they they would really react that strongly against Muslims, against anybody else as well. Um, so yes. So it sounds like it's a very very tough place to do any evangelistic work there whatsoever. Thank God that He's um, raised you up um, to be there, because as we know, our Father in Heaven, His ideal situation is try to save everyone. Um, it's not easy. The other thing is, it's a difficult language. Yeah, it's it's rated as the eighth most difficult language to learn with a unique alphabet. Okay. And words like "mama" means means "daddy," <laughs> so you, you see the boy running to his father and calling him "mama," then you know. Okay, so <laughs> not normal. But um, I've learned a lot of the language, but to share the gospel is, is not so easy and not so many people understand English. Mm. Um, but we've, we've been doing friendship evangelism. So we, there are people that understand English. We, we're just having a relationship with them. I'll share as well just a link to a little video I've made of what we do here. If it's okay yes um and also share the link yeah of a video you've you um you've done um okay. showing your family and what you're trying to do in georgia as well so that would be good so okay. johan we're gonna bring this to an end now is there any closing thoughts or suggestions you'd like to say to some of our viewers out there today i think we must just spread this wonderful gospel that jesus is the only begotten son of god and as ignatius the disciple of john said there's only one um, unbegotten, and that's the Father God. And there's only one be begotten, and that's Jesus Christ. Those Amen. are the only two. And um, that's the wonderful news that we have to spread in the world. And it is a joyful, joyful. It's really such a wonderful news. And that people would say that this is a false theology, a false wind of doctrine is just rubbish. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Johan, for um, taking time out of your busy schedule to come and um, speak to me today on this platform. Um, <clears throat> and to our viewers out there, please support Pastor Johan and his lovely family in trying to spread the truth about the one true God and other truths to the people in Georgia. It's a very, very tough place. Um, so I'm going to put the details up on the screen and if you'd like to contact him directly, then you have his, um, WhatsApp details, your email address as well, Johan. And, um, yeah, and you can take it from there, but thank you so much folks for watching. We pray that you are blessed by this, um, powerful testimony from pastor Johan. Please pray for him. Please pray for other pastors who are um also coming to this truth because i know that there are many more and uh let's continue to press forward in spreading this truth to as many people as we can because it's so so important so thank you for watching and god bless you all bye bye amen thank you very much